Well, some people are getting rain. We're not seeing it here. What we've had is a constant onslaught of heat. And I know a lot of other parts of the country have been like that. But let's take a look at those climate statistics. The North Atlantic Oscillation, that's been jumping around just above and just below neutral. Nothing of concern there. The Pacific North American Oscillation, a bit high due to that ridge swinging through the northwestern U.S. That's headed east, so that's dropping down. The Arctic Oscillation is neutral, that big old vortex around the North Pole. The momentum is just about where it should be this time of year. El Nino, of course, that's falling. Weak right now, but heading into the moderate territory. And the Madden Julian Oscillation, that's indeterminate. Slight indication that it may pick up in phase six in a couple weeks, but that's iffy. Here's a very interesting graphic showing the 24 hour temperature change. If it's red, that means it's warmer than 24 hours ago. So in New York City, big warm up compared to yesterday. Meanwhile, out there around Chicago, up into the UP of Michigan, cooler than 24 hours ago. And one place we've seen a little bit of a cool down is in the lower deserts of Arizona. It was very warm yesterday. Let's take a look at those readings. These were the readings at 6 p.m. yesterday. It was up to 117 at Phoenix, 111 in Tucson. We've shaved a few degrees off these values, not quite so warm today in the southern part of Arizona. But still, we do have those extreme heat advisories in effect. So getting right down to business with that surface analysis, this looks like a classic July weather map. We've got the maritime tropical air east of the dry line all the way up to the polar front into Quebec and up into Wisconsin and Minnesota. Much of the eastern U.S. is covered. You can see the dew points up in the 60s and 70s all the way from Kansas, Iowa, all the way up to New York and into Maine. More of a continental interior air mass further to the west, and then we pick up a incursion of Pacific air into the northwestern states. We've got some dry westerly flow into Montana this afternoon. Dew points are a very dry 20s and 30s in that region. The heat, of course, out there in Arizona, we're up to 115 at Phoenix, so not quite done with all that heat, but as I've said, we're down to 105 instead of 111 at Tucson, and it's a little bit cooler down there along the southern border. Also in West Texas, we're seeing 90s instead of 100s for a change. And even out there into Dallas-Fort Worth and San Antonio and Houston, more of a moderate character compared to what we had a few days ago. Most of the heat problems are up north, 106 up there. I guess that's going to be around Manhattan, uh, Abilene, Salina, somewhere in that area, and it just gets worse as you go north, 105 at Pierre this afternoon, and that's probably about the worst of it right there behind that dry line. That's very dry air that can be warmed very rapidly. The air out to the east is more humid, and though it is very sultry, it does not warm quite as effectively. And out in the Rockies, we've got plenty of thunderstorms all the way back to Salt Lake City, in fact, we've got this photo from the National Weather Service at Salt Lake City looking to the southeast. This is one of the storms that came through the Salt Lake City area a few hours ago. And what you see up there, for the most part, is the anvil. A little bit of mammatus being indicated right there along the fringe. That's a little bit of back shear. The main updrafts located right there. And I think behind this cloud right there, there might be a couple of towers trying to go up. I think that's probably the flanking line somewhere in there. And most of this right here, that's going to be the downdraft air. So quite a bit to look at. It's definitely helpful when you get rid of all these low clouds and you can see the entire storm structure right out there in front of you. That's what makes some of these clouds so spectacular. And I believe that's going to be the corresponding satellite image, and we're probably looking at that storm right there from the west. And following that through the remainder of the sequence, that moves off into the southwestern corner of Wyoming. And still quite a bit of cells out to the southwest into Nevada. And no wonder we're seeing so much activity. 
in the Rockies and Intermountain region. Those precipitable water values have come up everywhere where we have green. That's above half an inch of precipitable water. That's a measure of the moisture, the water vapor in the troposphere, although you can include the stratosphere as well. That tends to be negligible. But that's the total water that you can squeeze out of the column. And half an inch in the warm season, that's definitely going to get you into showers and thunderstorm territory in that part of the country. And as you pick up the cyan colors down to the south, that's getting into the one inch range, which is significant. And then further south, one and, one and a half inches right there around Ajo, Arizona. And I'll show you something from about 20 years ago. Yes, I was there in Ajo. Ajo is a pivotal spot for sampling that moisture coming out of the Gulf of California region. And I was part of that experiment there with the National Severe Storms Lab. That's Shannon right there. Currently, she fills your forecasting book orders. But back then, we were monitoring these cells that were developing in these elevated precipitable water regimes. And part of our job there was launching radio songs. So me and Shannon would launch these balloons at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. and pass the data on to the weather service at Phoenix. And of course, that would be collected for the research that was going on. And you can see that was a very moist atmosphere. Lots of anvils streaming northward. And as far as today goes, not an overwhelming surge of moisture, but you can see in the southeastern part of the state, there is some activity, some buildups there in the higher terrain. The lower valleys, even though the dew points are elevated, there's just a little bit too much ridging going on. But there will be a change coming up for early next week. So you're probably saying precipitable water. I don't know anything about precipitable water. Uh, what, what am I looking for? What values? I'll save you some trouble. If you go to Pivotal Weather, which is a very good site, pivotalweather.com. You look at that sidebar on the left, and uh, where's that product? Uh, can't get it to scroll there. Yeah, upper air moisture, or is it upper air heights, winds? Uh, it's in here somewhere. It's going to be under the GFS products. Oh, it's surface and precipitation. Okay, you're going to go down to this precipitable water anomaly right there. Precipitable water anomaly. And really, all you have to do is look for the green values. Those are going to be the significant ones because that compares the values to climatology. And that does show that it is a little bit on the dry side in the southeast part of the state. The values are high from the Gulf of California northward, so we should be seeing those storms. But they're clearly being suppressed. And we can click on that to look at a sounding. And what we see here is the moisture is just not very well concentrated in the lower part of the atmosphere and a little bit too much capping. But let's see what happens over the next week or so. You can see that we do get a little bit of a moisture surge going into Friday and Saturday. And it seems to pick up in scale and intensity and starts feeding on up there into the California valleys. So Probably in the mountains around San Diego up to Los Angeles, they may see some activity. And also an increase in activity around Utah. It does look like a little bit of a decline right there in New Mexico and into West Texas. But that tends to happen this time of year. So we are looking at an active pattern for the western deserts going into much of next week. And then probably a shift up there into the Great Basin area for about a week from now. Why the big change? Well, if we look at AWIPS, this is the current chart. Well, that's the uh, current chart. That's showing that Arizona is under this high-pressure area aloft. Another high across. Where's the center? Uh, looks like that's over Arkansas, maybe yeah, right there around southeastern Oklahoma, somewhere in there. So a couple of high-pressure centers connected with this subtropical ridge. So that's kind of locking things down. That's warm air aloft and marks an area of substance. But if we go into the weekend and into early next week, if you look at Arizona there, you can see it start developing southerly flow. So that is going to transport the moisture northward and kind of shake up the air mass a little bit and help to activate things. So that's the reason things are changing. And you can see the flip side of that story 
big old stubborn high across the lower Mississippi River Valley, which means drought conditions picking up in that part of the country. And out in the eastern U.S., we've got some weather there. We've got this MCS moving into Pennsylvania, and it's been moving very quickly. When I started preparing this show a few hours ago, it was way back across Michigan. So within a few hours, it's moved all the way towards the Erie area. It's already cleared Cleveland, and it's approaching Buffalo at this hour. There's a look at that storm on the Buffalo radar. They're in a bit of a data hole right there. Can't really sample the low-level wind field very well. I think back in the 80s or 90s, there was a WSR-74 site there at Erie, I, I think. I believe they even had a weather service office, but not anymore, I guess. We can try to take a look at the velocity field, and uh, we are sampling this up at about 7,000 feet. But up at that altitude, picking up about 60 knots inbound, so quite a punch with this MCS. So to really sample things, we have to look at the damage reports. And I don't know, it does kind of have the characteristic of a derecho. Don't really have enough data in to know for sure. We can also look through some of the surface data to look for a history of high winds. Erie, they had gust up to 41 in the past about maybe 20 minutes or so. But I'm not seeing any terribly high gusts looking at this collection of METAR data here. There's a look at it on the visible satellite imagery. That's going to be the MCS overcast, but a prolific anvil out around Kalamazoo. So I guess we're going to have to take a look at that as well. And it looks like it's developed into a multi-cell cluster. One part of that storm surging to the east, but it looks like the stuff on the tail end not very well organized. So we're getting mired in all these details and the clock's ticking and I have to get this uploaded. But this does show you the 11 hour forecast for the current time and the model has under forecast the movement a little bit. So it's got it a little bit further west than where it actually is. However, some of the tail end activity looks pretty close. So bearing that in mind, we can look at the pattern over the next several hours and we've got pretty much a continuation of movement into New York. We'll probably move a little bit faster than shown here and looks like some cyclogenesis out there around Lake Ontario, maybe some inclement conditions there around Toronto, maybe a bit windy and showery and more activity developing in Ohio as well. And the tail end of the front will be stretched down the Ohio River Valley. And that probably will connect back up into the southern system series of fronts, maybe, I don't know, something like that. And that's going to be tomorrow morning, about four in the morning. Most of the activity will be well to the north. We've got a good supply of moisture and heat coming up into the Midwest. Most of the southern U.S. is going to be ridged out by that subtropical high aloft. As we get heating tomorrow, some more storms developing in the Rockies and the Four Corners area and the deserts of New Mexico and Arizona. And of course, as we go into Saturday and Sunday, an increase in activity across Arizona into the California deserts. And we can only go as far as Saturday night on this particular product sequence, but it does look pretty wet in the Ohio River Valley, although they will be dealing with some heat especially around St. Louis. And here's that heat we're talking about for tomorrow, 102 at St. Louis, 99 at Des Moines. So this is going to be a big old blob of warm air across the Midwest. For Friday, not much change. For Saturday, about the same. But we are going to have this front coming down through the northeastern U.S., cooling things down by Sunday, dropping the highs from the 90s all the way down into the upper 70s and 80s across much of that part of the country, but still will remain warm across Kansas. You can see that by Sunday and Monday, that heat flares right back up as we go into midweek, and that 102 heat once again there for St. Louis. However, with that surge of moisture, it looks like a little bit of a cool down looking at 90s and lower 100s in the southwestern U.S., 
a slight bit of trouble in the tropics, the seven-day outlook focusing on the Cape Verde Islands up to the area north of Puerto Rico, looking at the possibility of development of a tropical storm or a hurricane in the next several days. And there's that beautiful tropical weather map showing the intertropical convergence zone from Cape Verde down towards Venezuela. The shading, this patchy orange and red showing the convection, and that's showing the unsettled, unstable conditions. So that's ripe for some cyclogenesis in that area. You can see that one low coming together right there. That's the one we're watching going into Saturday and Sunday. It develops as it approaches the Leeward Islands and up towards north of Puerto Rico. So that's going to move well north and recurve quickly. So we probably are not going to have to worry about that. That'll be mostly a factor for Bermuda. And of course, we'll have to watch these other waves coming out of the Cape Verde area. There's one good wave right there. But that's quite a ways down the pipeline for the probably the second week of August before we have to be concerned here in the U.S. So the only short-term issue is any unforecast stuff developing in this area here. And really, I got to get this out the door. The clock is ticking and ticking and ticking, and I know you are waiting on the update, so let's get that done. I'll leave you with some more of that great footage, thanks to Greg out there in the Texas Hill Country. Thanks to all of you who continue to help and support the program, and especially those of you who help to get the word out on social media. That is not my strong suit, but some of you may be able to assist with that a little bit, and that is much appreciated. Hope you have a great Wednesday evening. Take care, and we'll see you back here on Friday. Bye-bye.